Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. So, I hope everybody's here for the right talk. This is Pandas at a Crossroads, the past, present, and future. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Beck. Today, first, I'm going to give you the key important legalese slide that uh, Two Sigma, we don't offer investment advice at this talk. Okay, this talk is not, this is purely about pandas. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a former quant. Um, you not loud enough? Oh, yeah. Sorry? Okay. Let me put the mic over here. Great. Better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm a former quant. Uh, I've been a uh, core committer to pandas for the last 10 years. Uh, I've been managing pandas since about 2013. Uh, I've been at Two Sigma for about five years. I'm a managing director at Two Sigma, and I'm working on holistic approaches to modeling, okay? some of which we'll, we'll show you a very brief glimpse today. So Two Sigma is passionate about open source. Um, we are committed to sustaining the digital infrastructure for the public good, and that manifests in both building our own projects uh, and building on the work of others. Um, for example, we've created uh, a couple of projects that we've subsequently open sourced. For example, BeakerX, which is a plugin, it's a polyglot uh, plugin that we have uh, you know, contributed to Jupyter, actually. Uh, some other projects we have are Cook, which is a fair process scheduler. Uh, recently, we open sourced uh, Fast Freeze, which is a, an interesting way of um, freezing the Linux kernel and then actually saving it to disk and reopening it. Pretty interesting. Um, we've contributed to many projects as well, uh, you know, just code-wise, like Spark, Apache Spark, for example. And we, of course, fund a number of projects. Um, Jupyter, um, you can actually uh, catch a talk by Diego later today in this room uh, about some of that uh, action that we have there. We've, uh, we're funding uh, various aspects of Pandas, of course, uh, parts of Arrow. And on the whole ecosystem-wide, we, we have funded uh, Debian in 2022, NumFocus for the last five years, and the Python Software Foundation also for the last five years. So in this talk, I want to cover a few things. Um, first, I'll talk a little bit about myself and how I came to be the principal maintainer of what is arguably the most critical uh, and used data science library in the world. I'll talk about the responsibilities and challenges that come along with maintaining pandas. I'll give some context of the data science tools available and how pandas is being pushed to the limit. And I'll show why pandas is at a crossroads. There are three options that we see for moving forward. Finally, I'll leave you with more questions than answers. So why pandas? Or let's first talk about what is pandas. Pandas is a Python package that provides fast, flexible, and expressive data structures designed to make working with relational or labeled data both easy and intuitive. Primarily, this is the data frame abstraction. So a data frame is a two-dimensional labeled data structure with columns of potentially different types. You can think of it as like a spreadsheet or SQL table. Pandas adds an optional index for both row and column labels. So here's just a few things that Pandas does well. Automatic and explicit data alignment. Objects can be explicitly aligned on a set of labels, or the user can simply ignore this and let pandas uh, automatically align the labels for you in computation. Uh, handling of missing data from any data types. And size mutability. Uh, columns can be inserted or deleted from the data frames. Pandas has powerful, flexible group by functionality to perform the split apply combined operation on data sets for both aggregating and transforming data. Uh, pandas has intelligent uh, label based indexing. Uh, intuitive and flexible joining, reshaping, and pivoting operations. Uh, Pandas has robust I.O. tools for reading and writing data from uh, various formats, for example, CSV, Excel files, databases, JSON, uh, XML, and a number of binary formats, for example, Parquet and HDF5. Uh, and Pandas is actually probably uh, pretty well known for its time series specific functionality, such as uh, moving window statistics and date shifting. This is an important uh, thing. Okay. All right, is that better? A little better? Okay, great. Should I start at the beginning again? Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, so this is where Pandas sits from a user point of view. Uh, one of the primary use cases uh, is as a user interacting with data. They're both transforming it in both a pre and post dispatching to other libraries. So, you know, pandas, you'll transform your features, you'll send it to your favorite machine learning library, and then once you get them back, you'll do some post-processing. Uh, you know, pandas has many inbuilt functionality, but it's augmented by the huge Python ecosystem. Uh, machine learning, numerical libraries such as SciPy and NumPy, uh, 
uh, IO, oops, IO libraries and graphical libraries. Um, Pandas is really the Swiss Army knife. Uh, it's especially useful for any ad hoc analysis and greatly used in production. So this is a slide that uh, Jake Vanderplas has presented several years ago. It's showing uh, really there's a hierarchy uh, where libraries in the Python oops, in the Python ecosystem build upon one another. You know everybody of course builds on the Python uh, you know base distribution where you have NumPy and then you have Cython and so on. Pandas is sort of up in the stack a little bit, and then other libraries are in turn building on uh, Pandas itself. So there's of course been a tremendous growth in, in Python itself over the last like 10 years. This is a, a graph uh, showing various languages. Um, and the metric here is uh, stack overflow questions as a percentage. Okay. Uh, this is a, a similar graph, but this is specific to uh, packages in, uh, you know, in, in the Python ecosystem, some of the core packages here. You know, Django for many years has been doing super awesome, and you can see the recent rise of uh, data science packages in the last five years. Uh, coincidentally, I started managing pandas in about 2013. <laughs> so uh, this is a quote I, I stumbled upon on Twitter. Um, this dovetails oops, um, with the slide before showing the Stack Overflow metrics. Um, you know, Stack Overflow questions you know can often be bug reports, but they can often be helped by random users, and that is probably one of the you know the greatest strengths here is the fact that uh, you know you can find any answer you know, pandas on Stack Overflow. So pandas, I think, is wildly successful by this measure. Oops, crazy. Um, so here's a little bit of history of pandas. Uh, in 20, uh, the 2008, 2009 timeframe, pandas was started at AQR. Um, in 2015, we joined uh, NumFocus. And we've only received funding in the 2019 timeframe. Uh, we've had no full-time mainers until very recently. Oops. And I'll talk about them in a second. Uh, this is a graphic uh, by, done by NumFocus uh, three or four years ago. This is sort of showing the cost of building pandas, but this is all sunk cost. Um, really what is, is the trick here is, is the ongoing maintenance and enhancement of pandas. This is actually pro probably a larger cost than you know, was put in originally. So we need to you know, find a way to make pandas sustainable. And so, as I mentioned, you know, starting in 2019, we began to receive funding from various, um, uh, various places, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, uh, the University of Center, Southern California, Intel, NASA, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and at this point, we actually have three full-time maintainers, um, one at NVIDIA, one sponsored by Intel, and one through a, uh, a NASA grant. They are you know, managed by Quantsite. Um, so Pandas really has transitioned from a all volunteer to some, some, some paid maintainers, which is, which is great. And this really enhances the sustainability of the ecosystem. I'm personally supported by Two Sigma. Um, I'm not actually paid for pandas per se, but I do you know, uh, work explicitly. So. Um, here's some uh, uses of some of these funds. Um, we actually used some funds from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to build out uh, string-backed arrays uh, with Pyero. Um, this was actually a joint venture with the Arrow project, where we actually did a lot of the work uh, in, in Arrow itself, and then it was pulled into Pandas. Uh, recently, we've added, and this was just released in 1.5, uh, non-nanosecond daytime support. This was uh, supported by the University of Southern California. Uh, I guess geophysicists need this you know, very uh, fine-grained uh, daytime support. Um, we have a joint venture. Uh, with uh, a, this NASA grant, and I say joint venture because it's across the entire ecosystem. Uh, it includes NumPy and scikit-learn, uh, and as well as pandas. And the idea here is to build um, uh, APIs that can work across the entire ecosystem in a cohesive way. For example, in in parallelization uh, support. And we're working through a grant uh, from Bodo AI to implement various API improvements. Um, we have an additional grant from CZI. So this, this is actually a different kind of grant. This is to enhance the Pandas uh, maintenance, ma maintenance experience. So the idea is to build maintainers. Um, you know, even though we have some paid maintainers, the, the, the backbone really is the volunteers to Pandas. And so we want to continue to enhance their experience, just make it better. And this is also, uh, again, across the ecosystem, including NumPy, MapPyLib, and SciPy. 
So you may recognize this fellow. This is uh, Wes McKinney. He was the original founder of Pandos uh, back in 2008, and he worked on the project for a number of years. Um, he gets all the kudos. This is me. I get all the complaints. <laughs> Um, so for much of the early time on Pandas, this is from 2013 to 2017, I think this is 2017 graph, um, I did mostly actual code. I committed you know, quite a bit to Pandas. Um, this is me today, virtually all code review. I mean, Pandas has grown up. It's really a project, it's a very uh, sprawling project. Lots and lots of code across you know, many different sub subsystems. Um, luckily, uh, inside uh, Two Sigma, I do get to code, and so that's kind of fun. Um, Interestingly enough, uh, over time, I think I've gone from yes to no. So, you know, in the early days, you know, as uh, you know, people who are at startups, uh, they would say yes to everything. Let's add new features, and and lately, it's been all no. So, let's talk a little bit about the Pandas API. So, uh, Pandas is one of the preeminent data science libraries. Uh, we need to and do take care. Uh, I think probably backwards compatibility drives a tremendous number of decisions nowadays. Um, we're really trying to not break the users. Uh, this is actually quite hard because oftentimes we don't even know who the users are or we don't have good telemetry. Um, it, it, interestingly, inside Two Sigma, I can simply look up a metric dashboard and see who's using my function and just change it. I can't do that in open source. Um, and this makes uh, really migrations uh, a lot more tricky. So Pandas is used by nearly every Fortune 100 company for research and production workloads. Uh, it has 80 million plus monthly downloads. Uh, we don't have any good metrics on the user base, but it's likely a large multiple of this. And Pandas is crucial, is, is critical to two sigma. It's used like in something like 90% of research workflows. This is a quote by James Powell. I don't know if he's actually in this room, but he's at this conference. Um, and in effect, he's saying Pandas is useful. It's very expressive. It's good, great for ad hoc analysis. And it is actually performant. So in spite of what you've heard, um, you know, it does a pretty good job. So let's talk about the API a little bit. So Pandas is designed around a fluent API uh, method chaining. Uh, and as, as I mentioned, one of the driving principles is really uh, a commitment to, to backwards compatibility. However, it's really, I'll call it, open source iterative over time. And this is really one of the glaring uh, weaknesses right now, is the fact that like, if I were to design Pandas today, I would do something probably completely different. I would intentionally design uh, things in a different way. But we can't do that. We've, de we've designed things over time. And so we have to iterate from where we were to a better place. may not be the perfect place, but that's OK. So for example, um, you know, a lot of the early influences were R and SQL. And I think we're moving to a world where uh, these converge even more. Um, example, you know, why does pandas not have a select, for example? And so we have the exact same functionality. It's just not coded in that way. It's not, you can't write it in that way. So I think, you know, as, uh, you know, over time, I think we're going to be adding more and more of these, um, we'll call it spellings, which allow us to m make newcomers to pandas, uh, you know, make it an even, even easier transition. So around pandas is a tremendous ecosystem of libraries which are, we'll call it data frame-like. These generally are distributed data frame libraries, uh, not exclusively though. So for example, this is Dask. Uh, it's a task scheduler built in Python, which implements a data frame interface. Uh, Dask data frames use pandas internally in the workers and provides an API similar to pandas. It's adapted uh, to its distributed and lazy nature. Uh, Vex, for example, is an out of core alternative to pandas. Uses HDF5 to create memory maps that avoid loading data sets to memory. Uh, some parts of Vex are implemented in C++. Uh, Modin is a distributed data frame library originally built on Ray, but has a more modular, but it has a more modular way that allows it to use uh, Dask as a scheduler as well, or replace the pan can also replace the pandas public API by a SQL Lite one. Uh, Rapids, uh, sorry, uh, a QDF is a GPU data frame uh, built on top of Apache Arrow in Rapids, provides an API similar to pandas. Uh, PySpark is a data frame library that uses Spark as a backend. Um, PySpark public API is based on the original Spark API and not on pandas. But spark.pandas is a thing now. So you can get the same API using Spark. Uh, and Polars is a data frame library built in Rust uh, using Apache Arrow under the hood for data storage. Uh, there was actually a talk yesterday by uh, Juan Luis on Polars. Check it out. So all these libraries are all about lazy evaluation. Um, 
they are large to a large extent mimicking the pandas API. Um, and you know, of course, pandas is an eager evaluated library. And I'm going to mention one more library here. So this is uh, IBIS. It's a high-level Python API for data analysis. Um, it has a fluent pandas-like syntax, but not a lot of things are not necessarily spelled exactly like pandas. Some are. It, it takes a lot of inspiration from SQL uh, and some from R. Uh, it can express virtually any SQL query, um, and it supports a module backends for querying systems. Oops. Um, so it can support all these DBMSs, as well as big data systems such as Apache Spark, BigQuery, Snowflake, and now DuckDB. So here's an example of some of these. Um, I mention this because, in some sense, IBIS is what we would have designed for Pandas. It was actually designed uh, by Wes McKinney a few years later and maintained by, by Phil Cloud for quite a long time. And in some sense, this could be Pandas in the future. This is like one option. And I'll, I'll mention this in, in a few minutes. Um, in the meantime, there, there's a consortium that's been going on for a couple of years. It's called Data APIs. Um, this is uh, led by Quantsight, uh, and it's, it's a partnership across industry. And the idea here is both at the NumPy API level um, and at the DataFrame API level is to establish a protocol so that you can take one of these libraries and transmit your data to another library in a very easy way. Um, and you, and you may be wondering, why does this even exist? And the answer is, you know, everybody has, you know, everybody pretty much is using the NumPy API, you know, like, but they spell it slightly differently, you know, TensorFlow and PyTorch. And so I think this is, this is a great idea to really have a common standard API uh, at the array level. Whether this is a good idea on the data frame level is yet to be seen. This is, you know, everybody's essentially adopting some version of the Pandas API, which is, as I said, is not, in, intentionally designed, so there's some issues. All right, so let's talk about some of the challenges that Panda's facing. Uh, okay, so you might have seen this blog post by Wes McKinney. This was in 2017. I don't expect you to read this, but in effect, uh, Panda's is too far from the metal. Um, there's some thing, you know, it was, it was built, it was very performant at the time, but the world has, has changed a lot since then. And so in 2018, actually in this room, I gave a talk on the future of pandas. Uh, looking back, much of what I said actually uh, would happen, has happened. Uh, we've achieved some great milestones, like we have uh, a full API for extension arrays. Uh, these enable support for categorical and missing value support across data types. Um, these de facto provide a clean mental model of the block manager. This is the, the hated internals of pandas. Uh, instead, you can use extension arrays and in, in effect get a dick-like um, internal API. Um, we have a lot, of, a lot more support nowadays uh, where we dispatch to various operations to Arrow. For example, this is the backbone of the Parquet and Orc uh, readers and writers. Uh, recently, we enabled, um, I think this was in 1.4, uh, we can now dispatch for um, the Arrow CSV reader. Uh, it's a multi-threaded CSV reader. Um, and of course, I mentioned earlier, this can now back the uh, string uh, data type, extension data type uh, in Pyero. Uh, recently in 1.5, we've also, so we now have actually all data types can be backed uh, by Pyero, which is a super powerful um, uh, feature. It's not by default, but you can, you can create them. In addition to Arrow, we can actually also dispatch to Numba for various operations. Um, over the years, we built um, support uh, both for the rolling methods and the group by, so that you can, one of the primary use cases of this is actually to um, make your user-defined functions uh, super performant. If they can be uh, jitted by Numba, then you get really super performance on this. Um, interestingly enough, we actually had another goal in mind here, which was to uh, really build out the same algorithms that we have inside them, but build them in Python, and then we use Numba to jit them, and actually they're quite performant. Um, of course, the one problem here is we can't just simply ditch all the Cython code. Uh, Numba is, not, is still an optional dependency, as is Arrow, actually. <laughs> And so, but if that ever changes, then we will be able to ditch a lot of the Cython code. So that would be uh, interesting. Um, it's great for the, I think, contributors, really, because then you can actually edit um, just Python code rather than having to really dig into the Cython code. Um, Number also brings to it the possibility of doing parallelism under the hood and, uh, of course, GPU integration. All right, there we go. But there's an elephant in the room. Um, we couldn't address everything on this list. 
We've done a lot of things. There's been solid um, but incremental progress. Uh, the internals are still too far from the metal. Um, there's a lack of transparency in the memory use uh, and RAM management. And of course, you know, Pandas is sometimes slow. It only it does not necessarily have multi-core algorithms, uh, certainly not inbuilt. And we do dispatch to some multi-core algorithms for some things, but not everything. So Pandas has essentially, we'll call it the data tooling spectrum. Um, for small data, really works super well, and even medium-sized data. So, but medium-sized data has been growing in size. Like if you're using Pandas up to 10 gigabytes or something, it works beautiful. Ab ab above that, you can certainly use it, and a lot of people do. Um, but it does tend to break down uh, when you get a little bit bigger than that. And so, are there any easy solutions here? Why can't we just use a giant machine from AWS? Or should I just use distributed, AP, distributed data frames? And I mean, there's a lot of trade-offs here. Um, for example, uh, you have to balance, you know, are things easy to use? Uh, can I use the same API? Uh, how much does it cost? How much, you know, do I have to migrate my code? But I step back and I say, okay, well, first question is, do you really need this kind of scale? And there are some workloads that absolutely do. But I'll claim that something like 90% of workloads don't need this type of scale. And so it's not really a big problem. And if it is, you just get a bigger machine. This works a lot of the time, surprisingly well. Um, but there are times when it does break down. And so that's why we're kind of at a crossroads here. Where does pandas, where does pandas go from here? And so I'm gonna present three alternatives here of what we could think about doing. Um, so number one, this is, you know, what if we undertook rewriting pandas with a modern backend? And what I mean by that is keep the API and, and strip out the backend and, you know, maybe just dispatch directly to Pyro. So it's an option. Um, this would make pandas, you know, grow, I suppose. Um, but I think we'd have to end up, we'd end up breaking a lot of compatibility this way. The issue is that um, a lot of choices that other packages have made, like we'd have to either try to replicate at some cost to preserve the exact semantics, or we'd have to break them. Um, we would, in effect, be getting into the business of competing with everybody else. Might be a good thing. But, um, and this would need a lot of collaboration for this to happen. We would need substantial funding. Even though we have a fair amount of funding right now, this would need substantial funding. We would almost need a company to back this. So another option is, we'll call it that way. Don't change, just keep incrementally improving. This maintains backwards compatibility. Pandas is already pretty mature. Um, we have relatively, you know, small number of bugs. We, there's a lot of bugs, okay, but there's a lot of surface area too. But I'll say there's a relatively uh, low incidence of, you know, there's a lot of edge cases. Um, and this covers a lot of existing use cases. So this is what, why I think Pandas, um, this is really, I'll fast forward to the end, this is a good choice for Pandas. Um, of course, what ends up happening here is we, we may lose users this way. There may be people who simply cannot use it in some, some cases, and, and as you get bigger, that, that can happen. Um, the nice thing about this, this is actually covered by the existing funding. Um, this is how we've been proceeding for the last few years. Um, and, you know, over the last few years, we've added, you know, quite a bit of features. This is, this is since um, last couple of years here, a lot of these features here. Um, and interestingly enough, there's been, um, these are extension rays that have been added by external people. And so I think this is really a great way to uh, proceed can build upon some of the APIs that have been established inside Pandas. <clears throat> um, we're actually in 2.0, which is not super far away. We're going to be turning on um, copy and write. It'll still be experimental. This is, you know, a long time asked feature. Um, there's a great talk by uh, uh, one of the Pandas uh, core maintainers. I think it was at um, PyData Paris last year, something like that, uh, by, by yours, uh, Vandebosch. So let me present another alternative here. Uh, this is, I call it the other way. Let's embrace the expressiveness of pandas and in, let's use pandas and scale it in a way uh, where we can both have the, we can have our cake and eat it too. So we wanna take the pros of, of, of that way, which is, you know, pandas is compatible. Uh, you can do a lot of things with it at a very detailed level um, and people are very familiar with it. Um, now, 
this does introduce two tools. And so, you know, I don't check that box here because that's, you could view that as a negative. Uh, and you do have to switch your API. Again, for folks um, in the open source world, you know, it's hard to switch your API. I would offer it's almost impossible to get people to really switch your API wholesale. If you're starting a new project, of course you can do it. But existing people are just not going to migrate. Um, one reason we're embracing this inside Two Sigma is we can actually do this. We can say, okay, you're going to use this API. Um, and to the extent we're building a whole ecosystem around this, we can, we can make this work very effectively. So I'm going to show a little bit of our, what we call the Bamboo Tech Stack. This is uh, our internal name for what our, basically our uh, modeling workflow. And I will put on my hat now. This is my Two Sigma hat. So I'm putting my hat on. So we build upon uh, on top of IBIS. Um, this is the library I mentioned earlier that has a, uh, a fairly well-designed API. But the key is that we are building on top of this. So we are taking IBIS as a, one of our components. Um, we're not forking it. We are simply using it uh, in place. Uh, we're using a lot of the APIs uh, of IBIS. And what this allows us to do is to provide uh, one of the backends we use is Pandas inside. So this allows us to uh, use Pandas because it's easy to debug, it's easy to test, it works very well for small data sets. And it's very familiar, just works. When we need to scale, what we can do is we can take the same exact code and say run it on Spark or Dask. This allows us to get the distributed um, and nature and we can actually then handle much larger data sets without changing our code at all. Furthermore, we can use, we have a, an internal engine which is a, a backend, it's a proprietary engine that we built that can again take the same exact code and run it in production. So here's an example of uh, uh, what, we, what we might want to do. This looks exactly like, uh, you know, IBIS code. Um, the interesting thing for us is not necessarily, uh, you know, yes, we do joins, we, we add columns, uh, we do filtering, but one of our key aspects here is we support what's called user-defined functions. This is the key aspect where you dump your logic in a very um, specific way, and that itself is executed in pandas. Um, in this case, it's actually executed in NumPy, but same idea. Um, so that's an example there. So, but is this enough? And the answer is, for most use cases, this actually is. We can handle small data sets, we can handle long history data sets uh, via our distributed backends, but there's actually a use case we want to support where we want to support really large data. So recently we've been contributing uh, in a, uh, to IBIS itself and another uh, related project called um, Substrate which basically allows us to dispatch to an arrow backend. It's called a Cero. And this, this backend allows us to do uh, streaming computations. This is a joint venture uh, that we've been working on with Voltron Data. Um, this is interesting because now we've gone sort of the other way um, where we now, we, again, we have a, another backend we can plug in without changing code and we can handle different use cases. So it's sort of like write your code once and then you can just pick how you want to do it. All right, so we're at a crossroads. What do we pick here? Well, my two sigma hat is on, and it should be clear that I, we've picked option three. We've, we've, picked, uh, we've embraced the power of expressiveness uh, and the flexibility of using pandas, um, and yet we also have the ability to dispatch to uh, distributed or streaming backends as we need. And the, let me make one point clear here is that we're using open source as much as possible here. There is no forking going on. Um, we are just simply embracing the components that are out there and then using them, writing small wrappers where we need around it. Let me take my hat off and put my pandas hat on. I don't actually have a pandas hat, but <laughs> this is my cute pandas picture. Okay, so what should pandas do? And you know, really we're, we're basically down to option one or option two. I, I don't think the world can necessarily, people can use IBIS. I don't necessarily think pandas itself can use IBIS. That would be a major API change. Um, and so we're, we're down to, do we rewrite or do we just continue as we are? And I've made it, you know, my thoughts have probably come through before, you know, a major rewrite, I think if we could offer a tremendous new functionality to folks might be acceptable to the, to the, work, to, to the open source world. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily true. And so I think um, embracing option two, which is pretty much uh, slow, not slow, but incremental progress uh, through pandas is the, sort of the way to go here. Um, so, in summary, 
uh, you know, Panda started quite a long time ago. Uh, it's grown up over the years, gotten some funding, uh, and today we are standing at these crossroads. So, you know, please help us build a better future. Um, these are some great packages to contribute uh, in open source. Um, there was a talk yesterday by Gil Forsyth, an engineer at Voltron Data. Uh, you can check that out. And there's a talk, uh, there was a talk yesterday by Matt Rocklin, uh, and also a tutorial tomorrow on Dask. Please contribute to these projects. Um, and if you're interested in, in, in full-time employment, um, Two Sigma offers uh, many different categories of um, uh, uh, jobs. Uh, please visit us at careers.twosigma.com. And thanks. I think we have just a couple minutes for questions, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Jamie. We have five minutes for questions. Okay. It seems like between option one and option two, one way to put it is you pick option two because there isn't enough that can be delivered to make option one worth it. What kind of feature would change your mind? So the question was, uh, the difference between option one and option two is like, you know, what if we, what kind of feature would make we, us choose option one, essentially a rewrite of the pandas backend? Um, it's a good question. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of features that are actually shown in a number of libraries, like, you know, like, like, like in Polars or Vex, where you can really do out of core computation on these data sets. The question is, is that really enough to, to really go down this path of a full, a full on rewrite? Uh, it would be nice to do this. I don't know if that's enough. It's just, it's a, it's a fair amount of effort to get there. That's the problem, so. Notes. So thank you very much for the presentation. I'm, I'm thinking uh, how much this is a crossroads, actually. Like, the option one is probably not gonna happen because there's no funding and also no will to do that. And option two enables option three, or it's kind of related, right, because people will start either switching to something else or abstracting on top of pandas to then be able to swap the back end. So, yeah, my I mean, real question is how do you think it's going to play out in the future in terms of like, what the substrate is going to be for all this computation? So the question is how is this going to play out in the future? <laughs> um, you know, I mean, this is one of, uh, you know, so just to give you a little more flavor, uh, you know, Wes is the is the founder of uh, one of the founders of Voltron Data, uh, and you know this was sort of the vision a few years ago of uh, you know the quote unquote you know pandas 2.0, and he essentially concluded that you needed a complete rewrite. And so what he actually did is he's you know started forming um, you know Arrow as a a fundamental building block of libraries. So we've decoupled the 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 stack here. So now API is not simply tied to implementation. Now we have an actual implementation and you can pick your own API. Now, I don't think that's actually particularly a great idea in the sense that I mean, decoupling is obviously a great idea. What I don't think is like the world would be better off if we had one API actually. Now the question is is the world better off with the pandas API? The world currently has the pandas API is it better off? I think we should evolve it. I mean, that's really what I think we should do. Um, Pandas is here. Will it be here in five or 10 years? In some form, yes. Will it be the dominant library? I don't know. I, you know, in my experience, you know, replacing a fairly complete and dominant, a fairly complete library that does most of what you want is actually really hard. Because you can't offer, you know, there's a question earlier, you can't offer such compelling value that it's just dead easy to switch. You can only offer incremental value. When you have incremental value, it's very hard to um, sort of afford a complete rewrite. When you put your two sigma hat on, you mentioned some of the things that you've worked on there that have sort of wrapped around, you know, the pandas back end and various features. Are you aware of any open source projects that are doing something similar? Um, so the question is, uh, am I aware of any open source uh, projects that are doing something like option three where we, we provide wrappers around um, uh, the open source libraries? Um, not really. Um, I imagine, you know, just to give you a flavor of like example inside, what we have to do is build, uh, you know, bridges to our, our, our data connectors. You know, we obviously have storage systems and things like that, which we need to talk to. So those are the kind of wrappers or things that you want to talk to. Um, and so, again, you want to build, you know, 
once you have a modular system, it's very easy to plug in uh, components at the edges here. So probably didn't answer your question, but anything else? I think we're out of we out of time. Yeah. But any more questions? Um, I guess we have to take one more, and then if you want to ask questions, I'll be up here. Anything else? Yeah, one last. Thanks for the okay. informative session. I have two questions. You did talk about the time series in pandas. Can you give a little more uh, insight into it? What exactly does that uh, help with uh, pandas? And another thing is, you also talked about lazy evaluation. So, when you are working with extremely large data sets, is there a way to customize how much data we want uh, pandas to handle for lazy evaluation or just internally within the framework? Okay, so two questions. Uh, first was, uh, expand a little bit on the time series aspects of pandas. So I think pandas became really super useful uh, early on because it, you know, it literally allowed you to, you know, have ordered data, do things like ordered merges, uh, and it had whole, you know, things like it actually had date operations. Uh, these little things early on actually, I think, mattered a lot uh, in some of, uh, for, for its early adoption. Um, and the second question was, Ah, yes. So pandas actually, so the question is, um, how does lazy evaluation affect pandas? And the answer is it actually doesn't. Pandas is eagerly evaluated. And the question is, how does, um, so but all these other libraries actually are lazy evaluated, okay? So pandas itself is not. Now, um, I mentioned before uh, the streaming backend that we're building uh, in open source. This is an interesting point because one of the reasons you, so one of the problems with a distributed data frame library is that you know, as more and more data grows, you actually have to keep either having more workers or more memory in aggregate. You have to hold everything in memory. So this is why we're actually, in fact, moving toward a streaming backend because that provides a guarantee of a of a bounded chunk here, where you can only uh, use a certain amount of memory at, at one time. So that's I think how you bound it ultimately. Is there a, a library which? So this, this is this is the streaming backend we're building to uh, on Acero, which is a Pyro uh, engine here. It's a streaming backend. All right, thanks everyone. If any other questions, please be up here for a few minutes.